I give honor to the Holy Ghost, extending greetings to our pastors, our saints. I greet everyone in the wonderful name of Jesus. Thank you, the Lord, for this opportunity and Pastor Reaver for this opportunity to stand before you tonight. I don't take it for granted, but tonight I do believe that the Lord has laid a word on my heart for you. And if you agree with what I'm saying, feel free to jump up, jump up and praise God. If you feel to laugh, feel free to laugh. If you feel to run around the church, please do. Let's just all have a good time in the Lord, right? Amen. And thank the media team in advance. <laughs> I'm kind of working them tonight, even though it's, I'm not going to be long. But for some reason, something just got into me. But the Lord will help us all. All right, saints of God. So tonight, I would like to talk to you about my God. I'm not talking about your God, but I'm talking about my God. And my title for this brief first word is... The shocking truth, you don't have a God if. I know, I know, I know. So I'll get started. So some people claim to have a God. But if you ask them about their God, they cannot describe or relate to you any outstanding, defining characteristics of their God. Is he strong? Is he loving? Is he powerful? Is he forgiving? Is he merciful? They are serving a God that they know nothing about. But for those people, I am here to point out the shocking truth. You don't have a God. It's no longer a secret. On the contrary, I can tell you many outstanding, defining characteristics of my God. So for the next few minutes, allow me to boast about my God by revealing the shocking truth about those who don't have a God. All right, so we're going to shocking truth number one. You don't have a God if you can sit on him. I'm serious. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them inside her camel's saddle and was sitting on them. Truth number one about my God, he is not furniture. You cannot sit on him. God instead sits above the circle of the earth. He spreads out the heaven like a curtain and makes his tent for them. Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Hallelujah. God has the best seat in the universe. And from that vantage point, Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. That's my God. All right, all right. Shocking truth number two. You don't have a God if he can be stolen. Jacob answered Laban, but if you find anyone who has your gods, that person shall not live. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Imagine that. Truth number two about my God. God cannot be contained, much less stolen. Solomon says, behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And let's talk about putting God in boxes. You cannot put God in a box. He is bigger than your boxes. Isaiah 6, 3 says, and one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. There is no boxing God in. For Psalm 50, 50, 115, 3 says, but our God is in the heaven. He does whatever he pleases. That's my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
free. You don't have a God if he can be broken in pieces. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon, which is their God. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold. And only Dagon's torso was left. What a disappointing God. My God. Truth number three about my God. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? God cannot be broken into pieces. Job 9.19 says, if it is a matter of power, behold, he is strong, wise in heart, and mighty in strength, who has defied him without harm. God is indeed strong, but more than that, God is a spirit. Try breaking a spirit into pieces. Good luck with that one. Hallelujah. So now, saints of God, because God cannot be broken into physical pieces, the world instead tries to break him into separate beings. But know this, God is one. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And let's not forget, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's my God. Yay. Hey, come, mama. Hey, come, mama. Hallelujah. Hey, come, mama. Shocking truth number four. You don't have a God if he's dead, unresponsive, inattentive, asleep, busy, you name it. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he's a God. Either he's meditating, or he's busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. What a strange God. So they cried aloud, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Imagine that. So here is truth number four about my God. He is alive. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death, of hell, and of death. He is responsive. The poor, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. He is attentive. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. He's awake. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And he is not too busy to hear and answer you. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. That's my God. And we're on shocking truth number five. We're coming down. We're on the last set of truths. There's more, but the last set of truths that I will talk about tonight. Shocking truth number five. You don't have a God if you don't know his name. Then said Paul, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing by and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Truth number five about my God. I know his name. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. Yes, hey. for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the, by, spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the 
virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. I know his name. His name is Jesus. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. His name is Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Hallelujah. Shout that lovely name. Jesus. Jesus. I'm so glad I know his name. So many songwriters have written about the name of Jesus. Here, here are some of what they have said. What a lovely name, the name of Jesus. Reaching higher far than the brightest star. Sweeter than the song they sing in heaven. Let the world proclaim what a lovely name. And what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Jesus, that's my God. Shout out that lovely name, Jesus. Shout that lovely name. Shout that lovely name. That lovely name is Jesus, and that's my God. Hallelujah. 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 That's it. Go ahead. Why don't we stand and praise that mighty God? Praise the name of the Lord. Let's praise, praise that mighty God. Praise Hallelujah. God. Thank you, Sister Sandra, for that encouraging word. Amen. Praise God. We appreciate her dedication, commitment, and so thankful that she's a part of the Abundant Life family. Amen. So tonight we're going to move into, as advertised, I'm going to be teaching on a subject called the importance of being a self-feeder. Would you say that with me, please? The importance of being a self-feeder. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. The importance of being a self-feeder. Now, we want our children to mature. And a mark that they are achieving maturity, at least in the early stages, is when they learn to feed themselves. If you're a parent, you might recall when your child started graduating to that place. Now, depending on their personality, some, some children are more inclined and more eager to do it sooner than others, right? And then others, they just enjoy that, that uh, effortlessness of being fed, and they get a little lazy on us. And so they just say, why should I do it if you're going to do it? Maybe some of you have been there and done that also. And then there's the parental side of this equation that, um, you know, we factor in this because uh, we, have to, we have to graduate with them in their independence. You're kind of used to doing things for them. A long time ago, I heard this story of this mother that had been with her children. She she had not been out. She had just been right there in the home. And I guess her husband and, uh, wanted her to go with him to some type of official state dinner. And when she got there, she found out that they had put her right next to this head of state. She said, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to do? I just All I've done is talk to kids for the last few years. And so she said, uh, as she told the story, it was going pretty good, she said, until she realized that she was cutting his steak. <laughs> so we have to do some adjustments. And so as our children mature to be in self-feeders, as parents, it does open up some options for us. Like we can enjoy our own dinner with them. I heard an amen on that one. Uh, you can just free up time in general. But if you keep feeding them, I will tell you, it can save messes. 
And I, I tell you what, that's my hallmark. I've gone a long way to avoid messes. Kids have messes, but you should have seen. When our kids ate, I had plastic down everywhere. I'm telling you, I was, I was ready to go. And so uh, the truth of the matter is I can keep feeding them and avoid some of those messes, but quite frankly, uh, at their ages now, I'm glad they've matured and learned how to do that. Here's the principle I have in your notes there, that messiness is a part of maturing. And so what I'm going to talk about is that self-feeding, as you can see in normal life, so it is in spiritual life, it is a normal part of growing up. Look at your neighbor and say, grow up. So what is a spiritual self-feeder? And why do some people grow old in God while others grow up in God? As the quote is there on your note catcher, you never too old to grow up. So I want us to be clear what we're talking about. And by definition, a self-feeder is someone who takes responsibility for their personal spiritual growth and can mature to a level of self-study with the goal of ministering to others. You cannot give out what you do not possess. And so what we're talking about is growing into spiritual maturity where I take responsibility for my personal growth. See, some of you thought that was my responsibility. Now, I do understand that a part of the five-fold ministry, it is given to equip the saints of God, and I understand that. But a part of that equipping is not constantly just putting the spoon in your mouth by my hand, but equipping you to feed yourself. That's equipping, all right? A self-feeder takes responsibility for his own personal growth. So what would that mean? That would include uh, self-study, but not to the exclusion of resources that are available around you. So I don't want you to get this point when you hear self-feeder uh, that I'm the only one. You use resources. So I'll give you an example. If you find somebody to teach you a personal Bible study, if you are in a discipleship series, Pur uh, Purpose Institute, First Thursdays, hello, all right? Midweek workshops, we'll do some of those in August. Small groups, whether it's community groups, growth groups, fellowship groups. You just heard about Summer Rewind, okay? Abundant Life YouTube channel. All of those are resources that you can use to help self-feed yourself. Yes, by and large, we're working on ourselves. We're gonna talk about self-study habits, but I don't want you to think that it doesn't include others because growth is also a group project. And by the way, I'll act like I'm a pastor for a moment. I'm gonna tell you about all kinds of ways you can self-feed, but you know what? Abundant Life YouTube channels, I think should take priority over other content if you have thin time margins. What I'm saying is if you miss a worship gathering, tune back in and find out what's going on. You say, I can't, I'm too busy, listen to 40 podcasts. Well, listen to 39 and connect to your local church. All right? Well, that was good. Okay. So a self-feeder is not always on your own, but it includes personal time and growth. Now, but the end goal is to be motivated to take responsibility for your personal growth. To move beyond dependence on others to, to provide for you. So what is the end game of discipleship? Now I know this is simplified, but if we are to be a fully devoted disciple, I want to offer the end game of discipleship is what I'm talking about. Number one, being a self-feeder. And then number two, disciples making other disciples. So if we are to become a fully devoted disciple, I'm going to repeat, we need to learn to be a self-feeder, and we need to learn not only to be a disciple, but to make a disciple. Well, if somebody else wasn't a disciple maker, you wouldn't be here. 
And so we've got to grow to be a self-feeder and to make other disciples. So I thought it'd be good for us to test, how do I know if I am a successful self-feeder, okay? So I'm gonna pose some questions to kind of help you answer that. If there was no corporate worship gatherings, if there was no group meetings, what condition would you be spiritually? That's one thing that's gonna help you for yourself, Peter. And if you have trouble visualizing that, uh, let me give you a year called 2020. And the point is that if there was no corporate gathering, I already told you there's value to all of that. Let me ask you another question to test if you're a self-feeder. Even with corporate worship gatherings, even with group meetings, what is your spiritual condition? You say, what? Because there's people that can come like you are right now, but they're not in a strong spiritual position because they depend totally on what they get in 30 minutes on a first Thursday. So let me ask you another question to help to, to, to test your self-feeding aptitude. What is your Bible literacy level and what is your faith quotient? Not just of you, but your family. Now, I'm going to unpack those two phrases, but I'm talking about a growing knowledge and a growing faith. That's what I mean. I have a knowledge, a literacy of God's Word, but I also have a growing faith in God's Word. Amen? So, with that, you're going to find out there are aspects of Bible self-feeding. Okay, so that first part of Bible literacy, that is where we increase in our knowledge of the Bible. But then there's another part of this is what I'm going to call Bible nourishment. Are you aware that you can know Bible stories but not be nourished by the Bible? Right? And so... I need to increase my Bible literacy. I'm talking right now, and I'm wondering, how much, do, how much of the Word of God does your children know? How much of the Word of God do you know? Now, that should be relative to how long you've been on this journey. But I'll ask it another way. Do you know more about the Bible now than you did two years ago? So... This aspect of feeding ourselves with the Bible is not just increasing our knowledge, but then there's nourishment where we're fed by the Word, and that Word establishes our faith. And that Word will show up in our trials. That Word will show up in our hardships. That Word will even show up in our blessings. Oh, y'all are with me on trials and hardships. Oh, we need the Word of God to help me. You know what? Some of us need the Word of God in our blessings because I've seen too long, for far too long, that I see God can bless people and they forget where the blessings come from. And if you're rooted in the Word, you're going to say, hey, hey, listen, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I'm still going to bless His name. The Lord gives me a house. I'm not going to let it stop me from coming to church. The Lord gives me a baby, and I'm not going to say I can't come because he's got to go to bed at four in the afternoon. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you right now. The, oh, I got married, and you know what? No, no, no. I'm telling you, every one of those are blessings from God, and don't let the blessing cause you to lose out with the blesser. So self-feeders include the Word of God, but as you can see here in your notes, it also includes the Spirit of God in their growth plan. So what are the aspects of spirit self-feeding? Are you following me? I'm feeding myself with the Word, my literacy. I'm feeding myself with the Word and its nourishment. What does that look like when it comes to spirit self-feeding? Well, the first one is a spirit-led life. A spirit-led life. And that looks like intentional prayer and also continual prayer. You know what? I pray for 15 minutes every morning from 7 to 7.15. And then God doesn't hear from me again until the next morning to 7 to 7.15. 
I'm glad you have intentional prayer. But there's also something about continual fellowship. It's that spirit-led life where the Lord directs my goings. And there's not only that, but there's also a faithful life, okay? So whether, you, that means you're full of faith, you trust in God, but you're also faithful to him. You are growing in your faith. You know, faith is like a muscle. It grows with use. Your muscle will grow if you use it. It will not grow if you don't use it. You decide which one I'm an example of, okay? And again, when we get into the spirit, we understand it helps us on how we respond to tests and trials and the cares of life and offenses. Let me tell you, these are the things that produces strong disciples if we're self-feeding in the word of God and in the spirit of God. Amen. So let's go to the scriptures. 2 Peter chapter number 3. You can turn in your Bible there if you'd like. We'll also share it here on the screen. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. This is the final verse of 2 Peter. And it's really recalling its opening section in the first chapter. And we're going to visit that in a minute. But what I want you to hear is that the Christian life is all about growth and maturity. The Gospels, Jesus said, it's not to the one that runs the swiftest. But he that endures until the end shall be saved. And in order for that to happen, we have to grow, we have to mature, and we have to be self-feeders for that to happen. You and I cannot be spiritually stagnant and yet claim to be a healthy, stable Christian. And when cares of life and trials get the best of us, it could be an indicator that we are not strengthening ourselves in the Word of God and in the Spirit of God. So he said, you got to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go back to the first chapter. He ended with 2 Peter 3.18. Let's go back to the first chapter and see how he opened this up. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith. He's writing to them. And he said, those that's received the faith with us by the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He said to those that's obtained or received that precious faith, verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied. It means in abundance. Think greater, okay? To you, grace and peace be multiplied. Let it come in abundance to you in what ways? The answer is on the board. In the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Grow in that. I thank God for this spirit empowerment that we apostolic Pentecostals have. It is something when somebody does not believe this Bible is true, when we show them the signs and miracles and power of the spirit, it takes them back and they see the relevancy and the truth of the word of God. I thank the Lord for that. But let it not ever be said that we know how to move in the spirit, but we are void of the knowledge of the word of God. And Peter is saying that I want you to be multiplied in the knowledge of God. The Message Bible says, I write this to you whose experience with God is as life-changing as ours, all due to God's straight dealing and intervention of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Then he says, grace and peace be to you many times over as you deepen your experience. I wonder if you got that. Sorry, we're transitioning into another computer, so you don't have that message in front of you. So, hear it out again. The first verse, he says, you who experience with God, 
But then in verse 2, he said, deepen your experience. Amen. Anybody ever experienced God? When's the last time you deepened that experience? This is what Peter's talking about. How is grace and peace multiplied to you? When does it come through? How do you deepen it? He says, by the knowledge of God. To enjoy the privilege of God, it offers us freely. We have to have the knowledge of God. There's a lot of people that want the abundance of God's grace and peace, but they're not diligent to know him better through Bible study and prayer. That's why we talk about all these resources. That's why we hopefully annoy you talking about personal Bible studies and small groups and Purpose Institute that's about ready to come up. Let me tell you, that's what I'm saying. We need to be self-feeders and be in the Word ourselves, but we have also given you resources to deepen those experiences if you'll take advantage of them. Boy, I don't know what's getting into me. And if you say you don't have the money for Purpose Institute, let me see your budget and see how much you're spending on entertainment. Can you come back up, Sister Sandra? They liked you better than me, all right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's get back to the Word. Verse 3. As His divine power has given to us all things. His power has given us everything we need. What? That pertain to life and godliness. Here it is. Through the knowledge of Him who called us by, gl by glory and virtue by which we have been given to us exceeding and great precious promises, that through these inferred promises you may be partakers, you may participate in his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let's look at that. In verse 4, he's saying that, that the promises enable Christians to participate in the divine nature of, of God. Partakers, that literally means partners. Divine means that we as believers can take on God's nature as a new creation. And because we're partakers of God's nature, we can share in his victories, his moral victory. He conquered sin, praise God. I can live a life over sin. His glorious victory over death in eternal life. All that can happen as I participate in His divine nature. When you receive the Holy Spirit, it was not just a goosebump or a good feeling, but you are in partnership with His divine nature. And because of that promise, you say, what promise? The promise of the new birth. The promise of his protecting power. Look at verse 5. It talks about, or verse uh, uh, 3, that it's the, his enabling power. The divine power. He has given us everything that we need. So now we can participate in his divine nature. To become more like Christ. You can jot it down if you want, but Romans 8, 9. Romans 8, 9 says, you, however, are controlled not by a sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to you. That's talking about, I have, I'm in partnership. I'm participating with his divine nature, and I don't have to be controlled by the sinful nature anymore because I've got the Spirit of God living inside of me. And if that's foreign to you, get to be a self-feeder. Get in his Word. Get in the Spirit. And that divine nature is going to be fed and come alive. Here's another one, Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So with that biblical foundation, if you would throw on the screen there, please, you might have seen these before. We talk about experience, grow, serve, and go. Those are the three, those are the four one words. What do we add to experience? Experience? That's good, class. Grow in, serve, go. That's awesome. Now, what I want you to see is these four words can be seen both as levels of growth, 
but they can also be seen as continual patterns of growth. So I have in your notes there this growth process that takes place. So if you look to the left, that growth process, it can be stages of growth. So for example, in the experience, that could be the seekers or the investigators. A lot of times on Sunday mornings, we are talking to people that come in that are seeking God and they're wanting to investigate. So you could see it as a process that we begin with an experience with God. And then as you grow, you could put in there new believers because I've experienced it, I've tasted him, I've seen that he's good, I've been born again, and now I am a new believer in Christ Jesus, I'm growing. And that's what leads to the third one, serving, is now I'm not just a new believer, but I am a growing believer. I'm growing, you could put that in the box there. Till finally, I'm gonna offer go, as I said earlier, is that fully devoted disciple. Again, I'm asking you to look at this now in terms of a process. I'm a seeker, investigator. I become a new believer. I become a growing believer. And then I'm a fully devoted disciple because now I am making other disciples. Now I am, as we'll talk in a minute, a self-feeder. Does that make sense? It's a process. It's stages. But if you go to the other side of it, um, you can see this now as patterns of growth. And we go back to experience, and now we understand that we should never stop experiencing God. So now it's not just a a process, but you and I together, we understand eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, what God has prepared for those that love him. So now we see this as a pattern that I never stop experiencing Jesus. Let's go to the next one. We should never stop growing. I just read 2 Peter 3, 18. You've got to grow in grace. Grace saves you, but we're also supposed to grow in that grace. And then serve. We should never stop maturing in our serving. All right? So maybe somebody that that you see on the other side there where it's it's a process, they're they're starting to, to serve, but we that are becoming more mature we continue to serve and our, our, our expressions of service mature. So you know what? Well, I'm afraid to say anything because I don't want to um, shade or downplay any area of service. So let me put it this way. You know there's some places that people can serve that does not require spiritual maturity. It's very valuable. It's very important. But if you're in this thing 20 years later and you are still... I'll do something we don't have. Spraying the windshields with Windex. You need to start growing up in your serve. Would you get off the dumb example and get my principle? (laughs) Couldn't think of something better, all right? And then, go. We should never stop reaching the world. We do it through different methods. It may be invitational evangelism. It may be now I'm teaching a Bible study. It may mean now I'm going on a missions trip so that I can expand. my. my, All of this now is seen as patterns that continues to go. So let me tell you a story. I don't know what year it was, but many, many years ago, that's why I'm reteaching this now, uh, I came across a pastor who described a survey they had conducted. And the purpose of their survey in this church was to see if, the, if what they were doing was actually helping people grow, all right? And so one of the many questions on the survey was, how much of what we're doing as a church is helping you grow at the various spiritual levels? You got it? What we're doing, in this case, what we're doing in Abundant Life, how much of that is helping you grow in the various spiritual levels? Now, in this church, The results they got when one out of 10 was the answer started from nine and went down to very low numbers following the continuum of maturity levels. So in other words, those that were seekers, investigators, they would say nine, man, this church and what it's doing is helping me grow because there's so much new to them. I remember years ago, I think it's the same principle, different context, uh, I, was, I was in youth ministry, and, and, and a young person started coming over to our youth night 
from another church and they said, man, I'm telling you, everything you're teaching is right to me. And I thought, yeah, and it's going to keep happening that way because you've never been exposed to teaching targeting for you. And so when somebody comes in, it's like, wow, I didn't, I mean, man, I never knew I had to be nice to my spouse till you started teaching me this. This is awesome. So those people gave a nine in this survey. But as new believers and growing believers and then fully devoted disciples, was that continuum change, the lower the numbers got. Are you following me? So what they discovered was as the maturity or tenure of the member increased, they responded that the church was not meeting their needs. Are you following me? So they did some focus groups to find out what's the reason. And they discovered that the core said they weren't being fed, challenged enough with serious spiritual discussion. So, I've been going to this church 15 years and it just doesn't feed me like it used to. This is what they were experiencing. And so the, they said the mistake they made as a church is they did not prepare them enough after the new birth point to become self-feeders, to read the Bible between gatherings and intentionally grow themselves. And the older they got in the church, the more they expected the church to feed them. And as some folks say, that's messed up. But what was the conclusion? What is our conclusion? We're going to teach the Word of God in all areas, but we're going to also try to be intentional to teach people how to self-feed themselves. And we try it through all different ways where you can have customized personal growth plans. And I know we can do better in this, but I'm also trying to, and I'm going to try to give you some practical things before we leave, but this is what self-feeding is all about, is that I've got to get some things from the Word of God for myself. I've got to get in the spirit for myself. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, keep quiet. So I just jotted down some concerns about this self-feeding. In other words, while becoming a self-feeder, maybe here's some potential concerns that somebody might have. One of them would say, well, I'm concerned about retention. And I've seen this before, that, you know, I read the word of God, but I just can't retain it. Or lessons from our life experiences that we have. I read something many years ago that helped me, okay? And I'm not suggesting that we never remember anything from the Word of God, but this might help somebody. Have you ever seen water that goes over a rock that's hanging on the cliff? Continual pouring of the water over that rock as it drops down that cliff. The water is not retained, but that rock is purified by the continual flow. She said, why should I read the Bible today? I didn't remember half of it. You keep, you keep reading, you keep listening, you keep exposing yourself. And even though you can't retain everything there, it's keeping your heart and your mind pure. That rock is pure because of the continual flow of the water and the continual input of the Word and the Spirit has its profitable effects. Does that help you with your concern? Now, there's the concern of insufficient gatherings. Now, what this is talking about, and I'm going to tell you, more gatherings will not be enough to save you without being a self-feeder. Okay? Um, I know the scripture says, Hebrews 10, 25, don't forsake the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. All right? So my question is, what defines an assembly or a meeting? You've heard me teach it before. Whenever we get together as a people of God, Panera Bread, your house, my house, Abundant Life, 96, 29, when we gather together, 
the church gathers. But the point of it is, is while it's important to gather in corporate gatherings, I'm looking for disciples and worshipers, not just meeting attendees. And, and, and some of you may be concerned, well, we, we, we got to have, we got, we got to start having church seven days a week in this building. And I'm going to tell you right now, that may help you, but ultimately that won't save you unless you decide for yourself, I'm going to be a self-feeder. Amen? And by the way, I'll just throw this in. What about old-time Pentecost? Well, some of you aren't going back old-time enough, because I read missionary Sam McLean, his book, and in the 1920s, he spoke of having gatherings in his building only on Sunday. I'm not advocating, you know, let's, let's, I'm on the verge of canceling Sunday. No, I'm not, I'm not. What I'm saying is, what happened through the weeks? They had tent revivals. They had outreaches. They had personal soul winnings. They had more things. So what I'm saying is that if you're concerned, what we need to have is more disciples of Jesus Christ, and we're not asking all to come in here. We're going out there. We're doing what we can. And so Thursday group and Sunday morning is not so that we can take the rest of the nights just to ourselves, but you pick another night to have a Bible study. Pick another night to fellowship with somebody. We've got to also then have time for ourselves to feed ourselves in the Word of God. That's for whatever it's worth. All right, and then one more concern was this concern of inadequacy. And so we may not take action to be a self-feeder. We may not respond due to fear. You say, what kind of fear are you talking about? The fear, I believe, is inadvertently admitting that my power must produce it. And so what we're worried about is, I don't know if I can do this self-feeding because I don't know what if I've got what it takes to, to feed myself to be saved. Are you using the Word of God? Are you, are you connected to His divine nature? Is that what you're participating in? Then you don't have to fear because this is not a work of the flesh. This is a work of His Word and His Spirit, and we don't have to worry that we're inadequate. Of course, of course. Young children have to have continual support in teachers. I'm not trying to say that we don't need the teachers and the fivefold ministry, but what I'm saying is we've got to become self feeders of word and spirit. So let's, let's kind of get practical now. What are some self-feeding methods? All right, I'm going to list some here. One would be devotions. Um, when I say devotions, as you'll see down here, there's other aspects of the word directly. But devotions can include commentary or applications from the Bible. It includes scriptures, but it's not the same as reading or studying the Bible. And in your appendix, I have here this discipleshipnow.com. And you can read for yourself by the United Pentecostal Church. It engages apostolic teaching with uh, some creative things, and, and it helps you to along the way with your personal discipleship. So you can have devotions where it would include prayer and scriptures and commentary, etc. But it's a time of devotion. That helps feed you. Another one is podcasts, and that's the same thing that I just mentioned here, that it can include commentary, application. It includes scriptures. But a lot of times these things include them, but they also talk about the Bible. I do want to take a pause for a moment to say, be mindful of the source of these two. Be mindful of the source of your devotions and your podcasts, all right? Because it's important, the content that we're doing. And then the sums that you could, would imagine is obvious, I've referenced them, is reading and listening to the Bible. I know we have that avenue now to listen. And that, man, that's revolutionary. Well, actually, in, that's what they would do. Ezra would read the scriptures. They're, that's what they, you, you would hear them, you would listen to them. And so there's reading and listening, but then there's also than studying the Bible. That's not just scriptures, that's not just devotions, but you can get a, a, um, a, um, a Bible, all I can think of is illustrations, of what I call it. the Apostolic Study Bibles put out by the United Pentecostal Church, the NIV Study Bible, those are study Bibles that helps us with commentaries, all right, and study, and then you can go deeper in that. And then there's also memorizing scriptures. All of that are things that helps us to feed ourselves in the Word and the Spirit. Now, for years, I've heard people that say, I want to read my Bible, 
I want to read it better. I want to read it more. I don't think anybody in this room lacks the desire to get into Scripture. And I think some of this has to do also with our personality, our focus, etc. So I have listed here what I have given as history uh, of Bible helps. These are things that I have used to help. I shared this maybe last year with our young people, and so I share it again here tonight. The first thing that I think will help you in, when you get in the Word is understand it. <laughs> understand it. So that could mean that you can use different translations to get the meat or the understanding of that. It can be comparison. In our days now, you can punch a scripture and see all kinds of translations. Again, for our fundamental primary reading, I think we need to make sure that the text is faithful, okay? That's why there's some that are very reliable. But at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, I, 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 I pastor people for many years and like, I don't understand this. Well then, find something that will help you to understand that scripture, okay? And then the second thing is less is more. I say less is more as needed or if necessary. So I'm a proponent that if you can read, name it, one chapter and actually digest it and understand it, I'll take that over 70 chapters to ease your guilty conscience. Where the word is actually taking root. The scriptures talk about it's the engrafted word. What does that mean? It becomes a living extension. Okay? So sometimes less is more. And again, this is all about your hunger and motives. Like, oh, I got that. One verse for me. Get the principle. Here's the next one. Is all of it over time? So I think, well, I think somebody did this in a conference or convention not too long ago. Um, and I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm trying to, to, to help us understand. How many can say at least one time you have read the Bible, all 66 books? I didn't say how long it took you, but you've read the Bible through at least one time. Okay? Actually, we did much better than that conference when they did, okay? <laughs> Kudos. If you didn't raise your hand, we're not calling you to the altar. We're not saying you're a sinner. I'm saying that to help you with the Bible, I truly suggest and encourage you to set a goal to read all of it, even if it takes over time. Now, we pass out those bread charts, and I think they're good because it helps us to be strategic, etc. but they can be counterproductive if you're thinking, look, messed it up again. I didn't read it. Here it is, December, messed up. Start over again. We read Genesis 80,000 times. We're good at Genesis. Okay? But are you understanding the practicality of this? So, so yeah, I, I've read it several times, the Bible, through. I don't know how many times I've read it, you know, through in one year. But I keep at it. Not ever making me like Sean Taylor, okay? All right, so the point is that um, you get it. Set that goal. If that's helping, clear your throat. Do something, all right? Okay. Now, here's something else. Target something. Target something. And I've already referenced this, but here's what I mean by target something. If it's a reading chart, or you know, you're going through systematically, or it's a specific book of the Bible, or it's a certain topic, I am a big proponent to target something in, in self-feeding yourself with the Bible. Here's why I say that. Otherwise, when you don't target something, when you don't know what to read, Sometimes you don't read. And maybe that's just me. But I have sometimes trouble. Like if I'm not in a, like so right now I'm into this epistles. And so I'm, I'm knocking off the epistles, Sister Joanne. I'm doing a good job at them, okay? All right? So I know when I open up, when I finish this one, I'm going to try another one. But if I don't have any kind of plan, I'm just like, uh, and generally go, let's do a psalm. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Target something. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. okay? So I think it helps. Okay? And then, in fact, when your reading gets interrupted by another scripture or a, a being led of the Lord or let's get real, I miss reading scriptures that day. Oh, don't look at me so pious. All right. Let, how many have missed a day in your life of reading the Holy Scriptures? 
rest you better get it up quickly because lightning's coming all right my point is when I have a plan when I'm targeting I can pick it back up that helps all right here's another one paper or digital and I'm sure there's people that have reasons and probably feel strong about different reasons but let's take a poll here how many use paper you use the actual Bible when you read it all right raise your hand okay how many use digital version okay how many have never heard of a Bible okay all right there we go. now the reason I put that as a question mark is because they have their differences it was way back in Pulaski Highway many years ago when yes I'm old when Bibles actually started coming out on the computer and I remember one of the brothers, I was going down the stairs, the, the stairs out in the hallway there, and I was looking at scriptures, and he said, the Holy Bible on computer? He's like, wow, never heard of this before, okay? So here's the thing. Um, digital, I, I like that from the standpoint that I can cut and paste and make notes in my devotions, okay? Right? Now, there is a downside that it can be distracting if you get text and notifications and whether the Oreos won last night or not, that becomes a problem, all right? Okay. But you can silence it. There's things that you can do. Other people enjoy that paper that's right there for not being distracted, etc. okay? Whatever works, work, but there you have it, okay? So through all of this, I want us to understand that we have to leave here motivated. I've tried to give you some practical things of how we can become self Feeders. I wonder right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm not going to ask you to share it, but how do you think you are, 1 being the least, 10 being the greatest, on self-feeding? Answer it mentally, write it down in your little note. I don't know. Are you a 2? Are you a 5? Are you a 9? What are you? How well do you do self-feeding? There was a little girl that returned from her first day of school, and so her mom, of course, excited. As she came in the door, she said, did you learn anything? The little girl said, I guess not. I've got to go back tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Why? That little girl knew something. Growing and learning comes a little at a time over a lifetime. The important thing is keep coming back the next day. And the next day, and the next day, if you miss a day, you go back the next day. I have seen us sabotage our spiritual growth because we miss something, we disappoint ourselves, we do whatever, and you know what? Just pick it back up. I've said that so many times. Not praying like I should. Then you finally devote some time to pray, and you spend the first 20 minutes saying, God, I'm awful, I should have prayed. I didn't, I didn't. I'm sure God is saying, would you be quiet so we can talk? When you do that with the people that you love, if you, you, if you didn't get to be with somebody for a while, Sister Penny, your children live, most of them except for one, live out. Of, when you go see Josh, you, you walk in the door and say, I'm just sorry I haven't been here with you for so long. Say, like, no, just hug me. Let's have a good time. I'm sorry if that crosses your theology, but I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. And so when I fall short of some of my goals, the important thing is just keep coming back. Just keep trying to do it again. What God is doing through you doesn't stop with the day you're presently in. In fact, I believe we're seeing this day in fulfillment of what he promised in previous days. And I'm just by his grace going to be a part of it and I'm going to keep coming back because if I don't it cannot happen but that is why every church gathering is important that's why every personal growth act that you do is important that's why Paul said we've got to be confident of this very thing that he that began a good work will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ listen you've you've made the effort to be here when you got in that car and you drove here, you worship God. And if you're counting hours, I don't know anybody's worship God any harder than Sister Sandra. It took her two and a half hours to get here, right? 16, 515, one and a half hours. It's growing, praise God. Eight hours it took her to get here, all right? One and a half hours, right? One and a half hours, all right?
What was I talking about? Oh, I know. You worship God when you came. But what I am praying and begging is that when you leave there again, you'll walk away with some type of nugget or encouragement how you can take the next best step to be a self-feeder. You didn't come all this way to hear me teach. But what I'm teaching, I pray, will become something tangible that you can apply to your life and that you can be a stronger person in Jesus because you're learning to feed yourself. Lord Jesus, I've given you this night, I've given your word. I pray that somehow, through very practical measures, Lord, help us not to be mystified when we're weak, when we're drinking milk, when we should be eating meat. Help us, Lord, not to be confused because it's so basic that you would help us to be intentional. Take advantage of the resources that you've given us. Let them be springboards for us to learn and study together. Follow your spirit. Strengthen our own resolve so that when fiery trials come, we can stand up because of the truth we put in ourselves and your spirit that's t taught us to be faithful in all things. I trust you. I need you. I believe you in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said? That sounded good. Let it sound gooder. Amen. Amen. All right, you are a disciple, you are a greeter, you are everything God's called you to be. Love somebody, come in Sunday, know who's going to be sitting next to you. Let's be disciple makers, we're going to see greater things. In the name of Jesus, hey, we're going to have a great time this Sunday. God's going to pour out his spirit, you don't want to miss Sister Vicki, amen? God bless you, you are dismissed.